Let's get started. This session is about coordinated care. And I think some of you will know that I'm Rosemary Calder from the Mitchell Institute at Victoria University and I've been co-leading with Russell Roberts of Equally Well. The project called Being Equally Well, which we completed and launched last August. It was launched by the current Minister for Health, Greg Hunt. And it's a project focused absolutely on how to achieve coordinated care. Coordinated in a number of ways across the health system, the levels of the health system and, and horizontally across the health system and most particularly and centrally between mental and physical health care. So I'm delighted to be chairing this session. I'm looking forward to the presentations. If we have all our presenters, it's a tight schedule. So hopefully we will have enough time for conversation. And if you have a pressing question, please indicate. And if we can fit it in, we will do so. I'd like to keep this as interactive as possible rather than just a set of presentations with a brief time to ask questions afterwards. So we'll see how we go. We're right on time to start. And our first present presentation is from Amanda Wheeler and Helena Runfeld. Is that correct? And very briefly, Amanda is Professor of Mental Health at Griffith University and is known nationally and internationally for her expertise and experience as a health practitioner, an educator and researcher in mental health and pharmacy practice. Quite dear to the work of being equally well. And Helena is a lived experience researcher and PhD candidate and her research explores the experiences of mental health crisis and formal mental health responses. Please welcome them. Over to you. Um, yeah, Helena and I are going to do a, a, a double act. Um, I'm just trying to go, I'll take you through. Um, so, Pharma Bridge, which is bridging the gap between physical and mental illness in community pharmacy, and it was a randomised controlled trial. So, I'll try and provide you with an overview of some of the framework for that. But first of all, just want to acknowledge the people of the Yagan Bay um, language region who are the traditional custodians of the land we're meeting on today. Um, pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And also acknowledge all of the lived experience that's um, within the symposium today, consumers, carers, family members and communities. So this, um, this randomised controlled trial is a, was a partnership between the Pharmacy Guild, Griffith University, the University of Sydney and the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia. Um, and you can see across the bottoms, there's lots of people involved in the, in the, in the study. Um, and um, and, and uh, myself and Helena are two of the, um, the Griffith team members. So this um, randomised controlled trial has been funded by the federal government, um, funded just before the beginning of COVID. And we started on the 1st of March 2020, right at the beginning of COVID. And we finished on the 23rd of December last year, so right through it. Um, it's a randomised controlled trial of a community pharmacist support service for people living with serious mental illness. Um, there were 51 community pharmacies um, who um, were involved. They were randomised and they actually participated in, and worked with, um, with consumer participants. So 25 community pharmacies were randomised to the intervention arm and 26 to the um, usual care arm. Um, the study was across four regions of Australia, ACT, Northern Sydney, Hunter, New England and Regional Victoria. So of those 51 pharmacies, um, 17 of them are in rural and remote Australia. So that was one of the, um, the, the goals of the project as well. So I'm not going to go through a lot of this. We've, we, we know a lot of this stuff, but you know, this was, project was really about addressing the significant life expectancy gap um, that's attributable to, attributable to, to physical health um, issues for people living with serious mental illness. Um, we know that medications are a major treatment option for, um, for the management of many mental and physical illnesses. So community pharmacists are really well positioned um, right across Australia to support physical and mental health care. But we had limited research on the impact or what could um, community pharmacists delivered health services, what could they look like and how effective could they be? 
So this project actually built on an earlier pilot project that Helena and I were both involved with um, that was across Australia as well that involved um, community pharmacies working with um, more than 400 people who were living with depression and anxiety. And then in that um, project, the, the outcomes showed significant improvements for across most outcome measures, including medication use, treatment satisfaction, burden with medication, and, one, and quality of life. And one of the only things that didn't improve in that pilot project was physical health. So that's where really this, this project came from. Um, we also know that stigma and lack of mental health training and confidence and skills in communicating and working with mental health consumers are barriers to care for health professionals. So one really important part of this um, project was actually to develop and then deliver training that really addressed stigma um, and discrimination, improved confidence and skills um, to implement a new service for, um, in community pharmacy. I'm not going to go through most of the protocol for the study, but if anyone wants it, it was published in the BMJ um, Open in 2020. So what did the, the, um, the trial set out to achieve? Well, really, it was about, um, from the federal government's perspective, we have to demonstrate effectiveness and cost-effectiveness of this intervention. Um, so the intervention is an individualised pharmacist-led support service for people living with serious mental illness and it's compared to a usual care service which is a meds check, so it's a medication management service that exists right across Australia and it's an in-pharmacy medication review um, for and it's already funded. So we compared, we, well, we will compare um, the results from the study to that of meds check. And there's a number of outcome measures that we're looking at, um, including um, uh, medication use, but a lot of health outcomes, specifically focusing on physical health. Um, but again, look, also looking at community pharmacists' um, learnings um, and their confidence and skills in, in, in working um, and engaging people with um, serious mental illness. And then there's a large part that's the health economic analysis as well. So this is just really a quick overview of what the study looks like and I just really wanted to tell you just a tiny bit about what actually happened if we're looking at the intervention group, so in the initial health review. So in that health review, it basically allowed an hour or more of a funded time for pharmacists and, um, and participants to spend, you know, time having a conversation about their medication use and their physical health and really what came out of that and then it's about identifying where it, what's working and what might not be working. So what are the problems in terms of physical health and medication and then problem solving together and coming up with a plan of perhaps how to address some of those issues, obviously not able to tackle everything um, over the next six months. So putting some plans in place and that's not um, everything being solved in the pharmacy of course, that's, that's involving lots of other health professionals but being a bit of a hub and actually identifying who might be the right places for someone to access, access help for some of those issues. But some of it was lifestyle recommendations and things that Sam's just been talking about that they could actually put in place um, from, from, um, from their conversations. And so there were the tailored um, approach over the next six months for participants was really set between the two people working together. And so some people met on a weekly basis after that, others met two or three times over six months. It was really a very individualised approach to how they actually managed and tackled some of those problems together. And now I'm going to hand over to Helena. So one of the things that um, we really wanted to do was to, to acknowledge that pharmacies are out in the community, they're well placed to support people but they're underutilised and I think um, COVID-19 has shown us that we need more resources out in the community, we need more places for people to talk about their physical and their mental health and um, particularly um, community pharmacies in rural and remote areas are a vital point of connection for consumers and for their families. So how can we optimise this support that already exists? And um, FarmyBridge showed us that um, pharmacies could be seen as you know, mental health friendly spaces that people could go in and get um, support for their physical and mental health. So they were a safe space out in the community. So the training consisted of um, mental health first aid training for both um, pharmacists and support staff in the intervention and in the comparator group, but there was a one and a half 
face-to-face um, -face training that was just for the intervention group. And that included things like role plays and um, interactive training with things like social determinants of health, um, physical health, um, things like communication and motivational interviewing. And, um, and the pharmacies, and, sorry, and the um, training was designed and delivered um, by, um, by mental health, um, by the um, mentors as well as um, the, the people who were the experts in those areas. So um, the mentors were involved in the design and the delivery of that training. And the pharmacists in each region were given support from the mentor pair. And the mentor pair consisted of a pharmacist mentor and a consumer mentor. So a bit about um, the mentor pairs. So we work together and each um, mentor, like the um, pharmacy mentor and the consumer mentor had their own you know, unique perspective, their own unique expertise that they brought to the training and to um, providing support to pharmacy. And they worked complementary together. And the um, pharmacy mentor provided expertise on things like, you know, the intricacies of medication and how to communicate with health professionals. And the consumer mentors really brought expertise in the lived experience of medication and particularly um, things like areas of, of disadvantage, of barriers to taking medication, of um, discrimination and um, those kind of challenges around medication, um, medication use. And I think that, um, that sometimes there isn't always an easy alliance between pharmacy and consumers. Sometimes there's really strong opinions around um, medication and there's trauma associated with side effects for people as well. And, and I think it was good to acknowledge that. And personally, um, I've had experiences that have been very mixed around medication and I've had some terrible um, side effects from medication. And I've also experienced things like, um, you know, forced medication and not being given information around medication. And this is important because I think the consumer mentor provides a unique perspective on what those experiences are like and are able to share that lived experience of medication use as part of um, this program. So, um, yeah, I think that diversity and, and those different perspectives are really important. And what makes... <laughs> yeah. Um, was there anything in the randomised controlled trial about that, about the use of force and the, the kind of engagement with pharmacies or...? Not no. <laughs> in, not in itself, no, because it was really focused around people who were living in the community. Um, and, and whilst medication was a really, it was obviously a focus because that's where people see that that's what the interaction is going to be around, it really flipped a lot because the whole foot was around, and not even the medication for their mental health, um, it was really focused on trying to, what medications <coughs> people want for their physical health, or were there medications that were, they were missing, were there medications that should be, <coughs> shouldn't be there, so it was actually around optimising the medication holistically, um, and there wasn't a huge focus on, on forced treatment or anything. And that did, so obviously then is that, to, that seems to me, from my experience, not to be consistent with what a lot of consumers would want to talk about, even medication review. Is that well, it was interesting because when um, the pharmacists actually talked to people about their goals, medication wasn't necessarily at the forefront of what they were saying. They said they wanted help with yeah. you know, social goals. They wanted help to connect with family. They wanted to ease their you know, social isolation. They did want to engage in physical activity. So not many people, um, some people did talk about ways to improve um, you know, their medication use or to get better outcomes from medication or to come off their medication. Um, but not many people had, you know, specific medication-related goals on their own. So, I mean, in terms of the force, people may have talked about that. So, what we we don't have that in the like in the qualitative material yet. I haven't looked at it all. But it was there were lots of people who wanted um, to talk about how to change, how to go back to their GP and talk about, how to go back to the psychiatrist and talk about their medication. So, a lot of it was actually empowering people to understand what the medication was actually even for and the side effects they're experiencing and then take that information back. Yeah. And that certainly came out strongly in the discussions in the Birmingham for the World Project with pharmacists saying this is what we have been asked for, this is what we'd like to be able to do, but we can't 
Okay. <laughs> After that interlude. Um, so some of the things that made the co-mentoring work were, I think, things like being able to listen to each other, having a spirit of humility, um, and, you know, for being, you know, one, I did lots of road trips out in the um, regional areas, so it was a good opportunity to connect and get to know people. But being able to, to sit in the car and to ask questions, you know, what words should I use? How can I um, support people? How can I use words that are non-offensive and really respectful for people. So having those really honest conversations um, and um, for pharmacists to be able to, to um, ask me that was actually quite um, a nice experience. And having a sense of a really strong um, trust and mutuality, I guess, that was developed from working together for over an extended period of time. But it wasn't all roses and rainbows. There were you know, times when communication broke down and things didn't actually go as smoothly. And times when... Um, you know, we did have to have some conversations around things like, you know, low expectations and stuff. Okay, so... Um, this is... The, no, this is the, so this is the last slide, and it's um, talking about um, people who started off from recruitment, and it's, the numbers show the baseline measures through to um, completion of the final health review. And these numbers are really... Um, quite impressive considering the challenges that people faced around COVID and, and vaccinations and also things like flooding in some of these areas and um, pharmacists who had to undergo um, accreditation and staff changes and issues around um, workplace culture in, in implementing a new intervention. So there were lots of challenges. Um, and there were also, um, I think these numbers are impressive for people who are receiving the support because it's hard to achieve goals at the best of times, but during a pandemic, sticking with things for that amount of time is really quite amazing. And, um, and some of the other things that came out were consumers who were involved because they wanted their experience to help others. So there was those altruistic reasons of wanting to be um, included. And there were stories behind these numbers, and I think the stories are really important. So stories of... Um, pharmacists who worked with their local um, Pilates instructor and the Pilates instructor reduced their fees to um, support um, consumers in the community. And pharmacists who worked with health professionals to support someone who wanted to um, cease their medication. Um, pharmacists who held a space for someone to disclose trauma. Pharmacists who um, had a, a veteran who came in who was suicidal and they worked together as the support team in that pharmacy to reach out to this person regularly by phone. So those are some of the stories that happened underneath those numbers. And I think it's also the little things that made um, Farmy Bridge a success. So pharmacies showing hospitality to people, you know, welcoming them in, providing that safe space, remembering people's names, showing respect, listening to their experiences of side effects. Um, listening and, and valuing the consumer's own experience of their own medication. And um, one of the pharmacists described it as um, hearing the story behind the script and listening to the person behind the script and what are their hopes, what are their fears, what do they want to get out of taking this medication, those kind of um, conversations with people. And I think pharmacists were also surprised sometimes by some of the small goals that I think um, we miss, like people who just wanted to get up earlier, <laughs> who wanted to, um, you know, make sure that they ate breakfast. So I think those small goals were something that surprised some of the pharmacies as well. Um, and some of the other reasons why um, Farmy Bridge worked and why the um, mentoring worked is because we had lots of collective conversations as mentors, as a research team around what we needed to make sure that um, the experiences of pharmacists and also the experiences of consumers were listened to and that their needs were met. And that was ongoing collective conversations that we had. Um, and I guess just picking on, up on some of the points from this morning, there's lots of complex structural and social issues around um, disadvantage and discrimination that consumers experience. And um, I think what Farmy Bridge is an example of is being able to implement an intervention that can make, you know, small and meaningful changes around people, particularly, you know, in those areas of reducing um, social isolation and, and utilising a resource that already exists in the community.
Thank you both. Are there any questions? I'll take two and we'll have to try and squeeze out time later. Go for Thank you, Amanda and Paul Camino. That's a really interesting project. Just one thing, um, obviously as consumers made a conscious choice to be involved in this program. I'm wondering how you would roll it out. Like um, I'm thinking some consumers might, they go into the pharmacy and if they're any psychotic meds, they might like be offended if someone says, oh, do you want to talk to the pharmacist or the food workers? How are you going to roll it out? I mean, I think a lot of this is about, um, sorry, working with people, it's about developing relationships. So this is not something you could do as in a cold call kind of situation. And, and um, you know, I think it's from the, for the previous project we did, a lot of the, what um, came out of it was that people, that the feedback from um, participants or from consumers was they wanted to be asked whether there was anything they wanted to talk about today. It was a simple question. Was there anything you'd like to, you know, picking up meds on a regular basis, it was a kind of a lack of confidence from both halves. So both of the partners were actually, didn't quite know how to actually broach a conversation. So it was that, just asking that simple question often, and even working with the, a lot of the pharmacy support, the staff, other staff that are in there is checking when someone picks up a script. Was there anything you wanted to talk to the pharmacist about today? And it's just about opening a door. Um, and you might, that people said, you might ask me that 20 times, and it might be only on the 21st time, next time I come in, I feel able to actually say, well, actually, um, yep, and, and it might not be right then and there, it might be about making appointments. So a lot of this was appointment based as well. So it was actually to fit people's time. So it wasn't just a, it, that's not always, it, sometimes it's opportunistic, but a lot of the time, you know, structure actually helped people sort of, um, sort of balance it a bit better as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, and it was very conversational, so often it was just simply coming in and saying, you know, how are you going with your medication? Just having that really open um, question and making it very conversationally based. And support staff often had a, a connection with people, particularly in um, rural pharmacies, so that made it a bit easier. I am anxious about time, but we did have one more question. Can it be very yeah. brief, please? I think it's more based on the ladies. Ladies, question: Would you be more like a case manager with buddies engaged? You ask, oh, I need to, I need to focus on this, this, and that, and you say, okay. And the next time I see you, I'm just going to oh, repeat it. Time, bye bye. Do you follow up and do you talk to other mm -hmm. stakeholders in a in a complex case? You can't be just talking to yourself. So, the the question the question is for the benefit of the live stream audience. Do you follow up? Do you take a case management approach or consciously follow through? Yeah. So I guess a lot of this is detailed in the protocol and things. We haven't talked about it, but it was a very, um, we used it like a, a health interview. So much like the, the health check and things that Nimai talk about. So um, in terms of how to ask some of those questions and give opportunities for people to actually talk about um, issues they might be having. But of the a plan that the, the to, the partners would work together and create a plan, and then that was always shared with the, nom the person, the prescriber, or the, their, health, their healthcare professional who was actually providing most of their care. So if that was a GP, then that um, plan would go to a GP, and every time they had a follow-up appointment or something, that would also be documented and provided to the GP as well. Or it could have been the psychiatrist, or it could have been a case manager. I again, the person was nominated by the participant themselves. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, this is, a, this is a, a trial at the moment. We have to package this all up now and actually make recommendations and put forward a, a funding proposal with the research at the end to the Medical Services Advisory Committee. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. But we haven't, we haven't looked at any of the data yet in terms of effectiveness and cost effectiveness, and that's the, that's the crunch. You so. could have had a session all by yourselves. We do have to move on, but I would like to say to both of you and to the, to the people in the room, the Being Equally Well project was looking at what needs to change at the front lines of care. The proposal for shared care guidelines is absolutely and explicitly about the inclusion of pharmacy as part of the, I won't say triangle of care, but certainly the inner triangle of care, if you like, with other allied health. And what you've done provides the guidance about what's the training, what's the protocols, what's the support system that's required 
and that will inform what the Being Equally Well project is pushing forward to, which is what are the system changes that are required to make this possible, and the Shared Care Guidelines are the first part of that.